surgeon, every intern doesn't have the same skill set. They have a basic skill set, but then they have something they're particularly interested in or some subspecialty. How's that sound? Something like that they tell us how to go through the medical maze. Well, without further ado, let's let Tom, uh, he told me a story at lunchtime about the son. He's got some, a bunch of other stuff too, but I, I was speechless for 45 minutes, so let's give him a nice hand. <laughs> Do we, I know one person in the room. Is there more than one person that I know that I don't recognize? We got any doctors, nurses, lawyers? Anybody in here? Okay. No, no, that's okay too. Um, and you'll see me referencing these notes because I was going to do this next month and I don't remember like I used to. Um, the first thing is there's many good things and satisfactory results that occur with medical evaluations and treatments on a daily basis. Every person that graduates from medical school, what do they call it? Doctor. Okay, so it's like 15 years ago in Annapolis they had graduation and George W. Bush was the guy giving out the diplomas. And they do it in order of your grades. So the first person was Ensign. And all 556 or whatever it was were Ensign. Does anybody remember who the last person was? It was, it was a tall, very athletic looking black gentleman who was absolutely ecstatic that he was graduating. Much like when John McCain graduated. Ben Carson. <laughs> no. <laughs> Much like when John McCain graduated, he was last in his place. <clears throat> or close to it. Okay? And this gentleman ran up onto the stage and gave a gigantic bear hug to the president. And the Secret Service was like, but it was the best moment of the graduation. And he was called Ensign, okay? And different people had different skills, skill sets. I had a fellow in my high school class who was not known for his academics. He graduated, he went to a small college. He did very well in college. And I thought, well. Then he went to medical school, and I was surprised to get into medical school. And when he went to medical school, he joined the Air Force for them to pay him to go to medical school. <coughs> well, in the Air Force, they don't care if you're a man, woman, child, whatever your background is, they don't care. They just want you to do the best you can do, and they're going to do everything they can. So what I learned from that gentleman who's now a successful surgeon in the South is different people learn how to learn different ways and at different times in their life. Like the people who built my house are farmers over in Indiana. They construction people by day, six days a week. And they would never let me operate their equipment. They let my wife operate their heavy equipment, but not me. Because they were afraid I would cut digits and limbs off of myself, not their property. So, you know, regretfully, we can't talk about all the good things because those happen naturally and people see that happen. Um, and it should happen, because my view, where I went to medical school, was we were trained that when you have a patient, whether you like or dislike the patient, get on with them or don't get on with them, that's a sacred trust. They came to you for assistance, and you're expected to do everything you can in their best interests, not in your best interests. And, the difference between a doctor and a physician, everybody with a degree and a license is called doctor. The physician knows more about their patient. They know about their family. They care about what they're going to do in a different sense. Just because there's a procedure that can be done does not mean it should be done. Just because that procedure might be helpful does not mean it will be helpful. And so you have to balance what you recommend as a physician in that particular person's life and what you think is going to be most helpful for them in their current life and in their future life. And what I think we've gotten away from is allowing patients to make their decisions and guiding them to those decisions instead of correcting them and telling them which I see happening more than I would like. 
one of the things I would like to see happen, and maybe this is because I did this, is to get into medical school. I don't think you should even be allowed to apply until you've worked in a full care nursing home for at least six months. Where you're taking care of patients that can't take care of themselves, they're paralyzed on one side or from the waist down from a stroke or some injury, they have dentures, somebody needs to brush their teeth, somebody needs to clean their gum, somebody needs to shampoo them, somebody needs to help them with the evacuation of their bowels, their catheter, those kind of things. So you understand what it is a person needs on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of care. Care is a four-letter word in some administrative suites in some medical areas, I think, because of the behavior I see sometimes. And that's not to be construed that all hospital administrators are good people, bad people, or anything like that. But is there anybody in this room that believes that everybody who goes to medical school is a sweet person and has the patient's best interests at heart at all times? Okay, good. I didn't think so. Because the day I went to medical school and the day I went into different stages of my training, you get an impression of some people, and generally that happens in the first five to ten days, and it doesn't change. So the microcosm of medicine is the same as the rest of the world in that sense. Um, a lot of this discussion is going to be part history of what I've experienced or read about. Um, some will be funny, some won't be funny at all. Um, I gave you a couple suggestions about how to negotiate the medical maze because that's difficult for people um, to understand what's going on a lot of times. And you don't have to be at the behest of the system. You need to participate in the system and know if the system's working for you. And if it's not, you need to exercise your options, I think. Okay, I get, when I closed my office at the end of February last year, um, I had been slowing my practice down for a few years because of a family illness. And um, I still get calls every month, sometimes from people I know, sometimes from people I don't know, sometimes from people I don't know and they don't know anybody I know. Many times from people my wife has met that I've never met, and they have questions. And I don't know everything there is to know about everything, but the important thing is to try and help them think through their situation and think about what it is they have as options, how to investigate those options, and how to learn more about what it is they're, for which they're supposed to be getting treated. Never end with a preposition, sister said. So that's kind of my thought process on this, is what is it the person needs? What's going to help them the most? And so you're going to hear some bad things first, and then you're going to hear some better things, I think. And I'll give you some articles as we're going through that you can look around at. And if you want to make copies of them, you can make copies, and then I'll get them back in case I can do this or need to do this again sometime or somebody else. Um, one of the big things you need to know is that most doctors do actually care about their patients. I think we go home on Friday night and get this world barrel full of money. So I'll address that on the front end. I practiced for 42 years, and maybe six years I made low six-figure money. Most years I never made six-figure money. Probably a third of the work I did we didn't get paid a penny for. But if you manage your money, you're fine. And I always used to see the guys that drove the Porsche and say, that's really a hot car. I thought, oh, that's a great blue color. Can you tell me about it? And they'd be more than glad to tell you about that. And if you ask them what their kids were doing soccer and baseball, someone would know. And then I'd say, you know, where'd you get that? They'd tell me. I'd say, I got this. You got to get one. I said, oh, that's great. Does it come with a bench seat and automatic transmission? And then they knew they were had. So it's, it's one of those things where if you shouldn't be driving that car to church, maybe you shouldn't be driving to the doctor's parking lot, is what I used to say to them. And it, it's kind of like, you know, come on. The first parking space at the office shouldn't be yours. It should be for the handicapped people. And your parking space should be down there so that you get your exercise too. Okay? Um, <clears throat> one of the other things we learn in medicine is there's a phrase, first do no harm. And that, if that rests in your brain, you're always thinking, what are the complications that can happen from what it is we're doing or what it is we're recommending? 
And in part of my training, I was at Children's Hospital in the anesthesia department. And I'm board certified in anesthesiology and occupational environmental medicine. I have a master's degree in environmental medicine. So I'm at Children's Hospital. I'm high grade at the medical school when I was almost 25, almost 24 years old. And so my mentors are speaking to me at the end of the day one day. They said, well, what's your plan for these patients tomorrow? I had gone up to see people for the next day. And they said, well, OK, what if that doesn't happen? What if this happens? What do you do? And this went on for about an hour. I'm feeling like they're taking a club and beating me over the head. And I'm thinking, well, this is about as much as I know about anything. And I'm, I've been doing this for a couple of months. And they finally said, here's the point. The point is, you have to have a plan, an alternate to the plan, an alternate to the alternate, with an infinity sign behind it. If things aren't going right, or they go wrong quickly, where do you look for the problem? And what she didn't say to us was, look at yourself. Was it some intervention I took that might have caused this problem? And what intervention do I need to take to reverse this or make this situation improve? And that was one of the most important things that I learned from just having conversations with other older physicians. I don't mean older being 50 or 60. I mean, these guys were in their 40s, and I thought they were old men. Um, there are some bad players in medicine. We'll talk about a few of them as time goes on. And um, other medical providers try to be constantly alert to protect patients from those things. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do. Um, people remember the name Durrani over the last couple of years. This was a guy who was supposedly a spine surgeon. Down at Woodlawn, wasn't he? Uh, I don't remember where his offices were, but he operated at Westchester, he operated at the University, he operated at <laughs> Children's, I think. And his credentials on paper look great. And it just came out about a month ago. If you go to Channel 5's website, you'll see it. There's an article there from Cherie Palolo, um, where there was a letter that was written by the former head of spine surgery at the University, Anthony Guanciala, who's out in private practice now for a number of years. And some other doctors, I think, co-signed it, if I remember correctly, that they registered very specific complaints about surgical indications, surgical results, those kind of things and sent a letter to the administration to send to the medical board, which evidently didn't get to the medical board because Judge uh, Barrett had some unkind words to say that that hadn't seen the light of day until it showed up in court recently. So um, try as you might. Um, in my own career, we had somebody in town who was not known to have good surgical results, not known to be um, <coughs> the best as far as Gallo, and um, he all of a sudden wanted to work at the hospital where I was working, and I was head of the credentials committee. And our lawyers, and this is going back 35 years ago, our lawyers were the same lawyers at the hospital where he was working. But in those days, those lawyers couldn't tell us what was happening. So I had a bad feeling about this, and that the credentials committee, if you can block a bad player like that, that can go on for quite a while. And they get frustrated and they go off someplace else. But this guy had no other options. And I had seen his name in the paper many years ago when they were malpractice suits. They would publish him just next to Frank Weichel's column. I remember Frank Weichel? OK. They published him next to him. And so um, I went to my administration and I said, there's a problem here. I said, first off, this guy's got this handwritten application in pencil. It shouldn't even be process. And I knew, yeah, I know. And I knew that, that he had had suits because I'd seen him in the paper. And I said, you know, if I step up to this, not that I'm a great guy, but if I step up to do this, everybody else in the departments doesn't have to be in a firing line. There's only one target, me. And the hospital <coughs> doesn't defend me in that case. Okay. So the hospital didn't want to do anything. So I picked up the phone and I called somebody that I knew that worked at the other hospital and said, confidentially, what occurred? And I got an earful. 
okay. So I asked the administration of the hospital to pay somebody to do a legal search for all the legal cases that were out there on this person. And they refused to do it, so I paid my personal attorney to do it. Lo and behold, this list of malpractice cases comes up, along with not paying rent and running out on a lease and all this. Yeah, yeah, trashy stuff. Stuff you don't expect from the doctor to leave you to have it. Okay? And so uh, I just said, we're not processing it. You know, this guy lied on his application. We're not going to process it. So because the hospital didn't step up, they had to spend almost $200,000 to review every person of that specialty on the medical staff to show that they were treating everybody equally. And then it came out that this person had bad results. Okay, case closed. Well, the hospital administrator said, no, we're going to give you administrative privileges. Well, the administration can't give privileges. The medical staff approves people for privileges. And so this went back and forth for a while until I said, all right, you want to play that card? You can play that card. Here's my card. Charlie Lucan is a classmate of mine from high school, and he's the Channel 5 anchor. And I know people at the newspaper. So you want to play that card? I'll make sure this gets on the evening news. And there's two things hospital administrators don't want to see. They don't want to see their name in a negative fashion on the evening news. And they don't want to see them in a negative fashion in the newspaper in the local community. Okay, so this was back and forth for a while. I was threatened with loss of my privileges, all that stuff. But in my whole career, nobody ever, we, we never, everybody gets sued, and I've been sued twice. But we didn't sell those cases. I just said, we didn't do anything wrong. And it wasn't me. It wasn't a problem. One time I walked into an operating room and some catastrophic thing occurred, and I was just standing in the room. And it was a very unusual surgery that I saw a total of one time in my career, and heard about one time in my career. And some nurse wrote my name on the chart, and I got dragged into it the last five years. I said, I'm not doing it. They wanted $1,500, and I said, you're not getting paid, because I'm going to get to report this for the rest of my career. The second time, it was somebody with getting a superficial biopsy, <coughs> It could be done under local anesthesia, but had a mouthful of loose, rotten teeth and wanted to be put to sleep. And I said, why can't I do that? Because when you wake up, you're going to bite down and those teeth are going to start popping out. And um, so why can't I do that? We'll just stay too long. And yeah, she didn't like her scar, so she sued the surgeon and me. And they could never find a witness. And it went on for five years. So finally, the judge, Judge Wood, threw it out. So, there are cases where people need to be sued. You've got to remember that, too, because I've seen that happen. It needs to occur. Um, so anyway, um, the, the physician is supposed to give the honest news. Maybe not good news, but the honest news. We're supposed to be honest with you, tell you what we think the best course of action is, what your options are, and help you guide your decision-making process. If you feel like you're being bum-rushed into making a decision and your antenna go up, think about that. Because if your intuition is telling you, I'm not liking this, maybe that's a red flag for you. And you better think twice about that. If your doctor offers you a second opinion, I think that's always great. We did that routinely in our intensive care unit when we had patients with serious trauma, major surgical procedures that were on the ventilator, or getting in very intensive medical care, and we would keep the family informed about what was going on. But if we thought they needed a second opinion for them to feel good, because it's kind of like a, a one more funeral than a wedding. At a funeral, everybody <coughs> comes out of the woodwork and they want to be in charge and they want to have their two cents worth with that. Well, when somebody's sick in the hospital, the son that hasn't talked to mom in five years shows up, and the daughter that's been fighting with dad for 10 years shows up, the grandkids at home, and everybody wants to have their piece of what's going on. Well, you can't really take care of the patient and deal with 20 family members during the day, so what we would ask is we'd ask one family member. We make rounds about such and such in the morning and about such and such in the evening. We're glad to talk to people, but we can't talk to people 20 times a day because then we can't get anything else done. And we try to 
capsulize that and then have that captain speak to the rest of the family, encourage them to write things down, ask their questions, and try to be as honest with them as we can. Because we have to be functional to be able to take care of the other people that need to be taken care of on that particular day and during that particular week, especially if you're the person on the call and you're going to be working 24 more hours straight, which happens a lot, um, in the hospital venue at least. Um, if your doctor gets upset when you ask for a second opinion, my antenna would go way high, way fast, as my grandkids would say. When you ask that question and they get angry, I'm looking for the door if that happens. Now, that doesn't even happen to me, but I'm looking for the door because I'm thinking, what's the issue here? Um, So second opinions are good things. Don't let your insurance carrier bully you. Read the contract. Go online and read it, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, whatever it is, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem. Read the plan. Try and find out what's going on. And why this is important is because you find where you're supposed to go to request approval for this, that, and the other thing. Okay, example. My son needed to be transferred by air from Christ Hospital to the Cleveland Clinic. He had a known history of end-stage heart failure. He was waiting on a heart transplant. And they were sending him up there in hopes of getting a heart transplant. And UC did not have an active heart transplant program at the time. Theirs was took a sleep a number of years before that. Now it's reopened. They brought a bunch of people from the Minneapolis Heart Institute. So my son had been told that the flight would cost, by one group, about $15,000, by another group, about $25,000. He didn't have that kind of money. So I said, sign the paper. We'll worry about that later. <coughs> well, he had two doctors at Christ Hospital. One was an MD, one was an MD and PhD with a subspecialty in just a heart failure. And they checked up all the boxes why a surface ambulance transport was inappropriate and he needed air transport. The doctors at the Cleveland Clinic, similar credentials, same thing. So you think, okay, it's a done deal. Well, the insurance company denied it. And so he and I went to Florida for a year to wait for heart transplant down there because the geography of Florida, they had hearts that weren't matching the patients, so they were going unused. And so they approached us about one down there. So we went down there. Plus, they get hearts from the Caribbean, from Puerto Rico and other places in the Caribbean because they don't have transplant programs. But they can they go there and do an organ procurement. And it's summer all year in those places. So people are doing things that end up making them an organ donor. Okay? Whether it's car wrecks, motorcycle accidents, uh, uh, drownings, those kind of things. So, we get down there, we're down there about a month, and he gets a denial for this, this transfer. And he wants to take care of it himself. And I said, you know, this is not your bailiwick. This is my bailiwick. You really have to think twice about this. So they denied me multiple times. Um, and this transfer occurred just after Labor Day of 2015. He ended up getting his heart transplanted in April of 2016. The bill was reviewed on three occasions by doctors um, at the request of the insurance company. None of the doctors were cardiologists. They were all emergency room doctors who don't deal with this issue on a regular basis. They're, so you've got all these cardiologists from Christ Hospital and Cleveland Clinic that have signed off on this and said, yeah, this is what's needed. And then the insurance company has it reviewed by not one, but three emergency room doctors over a couple of years. To the point that I've already penned a letter that, you know, obviously he's not going to use it because it's got my name on it, but somebody else could use the Word document, and put their name on it, revise it whatever way they want. I don't care. It's got the facts in it. And so finally, after over two years, they finally paid the bill. And I asked the air transport company, I said, how long does this take usually? And he said, two years is not uncommon. How many of these 
get held up like this by the insurance company. He said, 99 out of 100. <laughs> so if there's something that you think you need, that your doctors tell you you need, that you can find on the internet that's justified, and you've got the indications for it, don't back down. Push with them and fight with them, and go through that process, and look at the credentials. Ask that question. I want a copy of the review. I want a copy of the doctor's credentials. I want to know in what state they're licensed, are they actively practicing. Years ago, my wife had a nubby here that was hard as a rock. And she had a chest x-ray, they didn't find anything. The radiologist recommended a CAT scan. So we requested the CAT scan, they said no, it's not justified. The radiologist recommended it. That's the next stage for a mass of unknown origin and unknown cause. You do that before you do the biopsy. No, no, no. I asked those questions. I found out they were using a surgeon who was almost 80 years old that had retired. I said, well, I need to know where he's actively licensed. We well, can't tell you that information. I said, you give me his name. I said, I know where your home office is. I can search that 50 times in 50 states. But I said, I'm only going to search it in your state. And I said, I'll find the guy on the internet. And then I'm going to send him a letter that says, I hope you have insurance for what you're doing here, because this has been recommended by a board certified residency trained radiologist. It's been reviewed by one of her associates at the conference meeting. They recommended this, and you're out of specialty, and you've gone against their recommendations, and that affects my wife's care. Now, we're going to get the CAT scan anyway. Okay, we're going to pay for it, and then we'll fight with them. So don't back down to those things, okay? My daughter had an episode when she turned 21. She went out for a couple of breaks with a couple of her friends. And by a couple, I mean a couple. And they were driving. And the next morning, she collapsed. And she was at home, and a friend of hers happened to be there. And they picked her up and brought her to the emergency room. And they called me, and I was in the clinic. And I was trying to get out of the clinic to get to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, they took an x-ray, taken an x-ray of her knee. And I said, well, did you do a CT scan of her lungs? And they said, no. I said, well, why not? They said, well, we didn't see any reason. I said, this is a young woman who collapsed. I said, that's a pulmonary embolism until proven otherwise. Well, we didn't think it was necessary. Really? I said, it's, it's indicated and it's necessary to make sure she had a pulmonary embolism. So, and this was, I'm talking to the doctor I went to medical school and college with, and we did residency in the same hospital, who I had the history with other people in another hospital that was unpleasant. Well, I said, okay, that's fine. I, I can take care of this. I don't need you to write this order. I can take care of this. So we walked out of the entrance room, walked to the other side of the building to the cardiologist's office. They did an echocardiogram on her. They said, this is not normal. Go back and get the CAT scan done. <laughs> we walked back the other side of the building, right next to the emergency room, had the CAT scan done. The radiologist comes out and says, the CAT scan's not normal. Okay, thanks. Walk out, and there's the ER like, I said, you might want to see this CAT scan. So learn about your condition as much as you can. Not everything you read on the internet is going to be truthful, but you're going to be able to find a lot of good information that's going to help you negotiate the system and ask good questions. Don't be a receiver of medical care. Be a participant and a driver of your medical care. Okay? You need to know what's going on. You know, you don't pull into the gas station anymore and sit there and somebody's checking the oil, putting stuff in to wash the windshield, cleaning the windshield, checking the tires, and putting the gas in. You got to do that stuff. Now. You got to get your grandkids to do it. Okay. So you got to be that same kind of a participant in your medical. Medical bills. This is always a good one. Anybody read the back of the bill, the small print? Have you ever done that? No. Okay. You know what the best insurance is in the U.S.? Medicare. Medicaid. Because they pay absolutely nothing. Okay, that's insurance for people on welfare. You've been in the emergency room and they said, well, okay, we need you to make your copay. $300, $500, whatever it is, you give them a credit card or your uh, HSA card, and they run that. And the people next to you, they say, 
okay, blah, 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 what's your insurance? I have the car. That's what they mean by that. And it's not a negative comment about those people, but that's how the system goes. And they don't pay anything, so they're not getting a card swiped that says they're who they are. In the old days, before they took a picture, they scanned your driver's license, your insurance card, we would have patients come into the hospital and they would say, I'm Tom Young. And they'd say, okay, where's your insurance card? Why don't you have with me? I forgot. I was feeling real bad. I left the house on my wall. They'd be in the hospital and they'd have all the symptoms of the kidney stone. And some, every once in a while, they'd prick their finger and put some blood in their urine. Well, we had this happen numerous times. Yeah, they'd, let, they'd go undergo a procedure. They had x-rays, they'd go in, and the, radio, or the urologist would put a catheter up into the ureter. They'd shoot dye up there. They couldn't find a stone. Well, they were drug-seeking people. And this is the extent to which they would go. And I, one of them I remember, because I always thought it was kind of funny. People would steal two things from the hospital. They would steal those little plastic phones that hit the stick on that said, this will work at home. And they would steal the crucifixes from the hospitals. And they were sold Bibles. They sold the crucifixes. Okay. Well, this particular guy, we found out when we kind of got suspicious about him, um, the internist and I talked. And the next thing we know, the guy was gone from the hospital. He just left. We didn't realize, they didn't realize it for a couple hours because some people think he's down in x ray and people think he's down in the recovery room. And you know, he woke up and realized we were on to him and we're getting ready to close the loop on him. And uh, he took off. But when he took off, he took the television off the wall. <laughs> this one of those little black and white things they used to have, the pictures used to have, and you pay them two bucks a day. This was when they had color TVs up on the wall. He took the color TV. So we called around and found out that old Mercy and Marymont, he had been there the week before he was with us, and he had done the same thing there. So there are bad player patients, too, okay? So that kind of stuff happens. But your medical bills, read your medical bills on the back, okay? In the emergency room or someplace in the hospital, there's usually a sheet about this size that talks about Hill Burton. Well, the reason hospitals can get money a lot of times to build these... Uh, um, new additions and stuff like that. Part of that is federal money. It's called Hilberton Funds. And so this little piece of paper says, you know, they take care of anybody and everybody as long as it's appropriate for the hospital, essentially. Okay. So if somebody's got a leaking aneurysm and they show up in, you know, Poda 50 bed hospital, they're not going to be able to take care of that there, but they're going to try to get an ambulance or helicopter to get them to a major medical center to get them care of and hope they don't die along the way. So these Hilberton funds means they have to take care of people and people that don't have means, they have to make some accommodation with those folks. Okay, so what we used to do in our office is if people paid five dollars a month for six months straight, they didn't miss any, the week before Christmas, we would stop billing them and write all that off. Okay? Most people don't do that. But we were able to do that. The reason you have to bill them is because if you don't bill them, the federal government will charge you with fraud. So that's why you get a bill for the copay and the deductibles and those kind of things. Because the federal government has taken doctors to court and kicked them out of the Medicare program because they didn't bill them. The first time they did it was a cardiologist in an inner city hospital in Philadelphia that would read EKGs and he would get like $3 for reading EKG. It would cost him $6 to bill the EKG. So he figured most of these people couldn't afford it anyway. It was costing them money to bill it. And he would see these patients in the hospital for their echocardiograms and their cardiac catheterizations and those kind of things. So he thought he was being a good soul until the Department of Justice came after him and kicked him out of the Medicare program after giving him a six figure fine. Mm -hmm. So there's bad players on the administrative <coughs> side, too, on the insurance thing. Well, the reason you look at that bill is because you can negotiate that down. It'll have financial markers on the back, like if there's so many people in the family, so many times the poverty line, those kind of things. And your bill will be discounted based on that. And you don't have to pay that all at one time. You can tell them, I'm going to pay $5 a month or $10 a month, and that's what I'm going to do. And you can negotiate that. They'll want you to put it on a credit card, and I would suggest that you don't do that, unless you're going to pay the whole thing off right away and you're able to. And you get the points or rewards, whatever. 
But if you really have to pay it off over time, don't put it on a credit card. I mean, we had a, a family that's close to us, and they had a child born with a heart defect that needed surgery about the third or fourth day of life. And the child's done spectacularly. But the hospital that did the surgery convinced this young couple that they should put this on credit card. So the bill got diminished, but it was still in the six-figure mark. And I have no idea how they had that much credit, but they did. So they put it on credit cards. What happens when you pay a bill on credit cards? Mm. You never pay it off because the interest <coughs> rates are generally over 15%, sometimes as high as 24. So, Hamlin, wake up. We went to school together. So, you know, negotiate it down. Call and ask the question. You don't have to feel like you're going to be sucked dry by the medical system because most doctors are reasonable people and they're not going to do that, you know? And if, the, if you get somebody in the office that's nasty, ask the doctor at the office. A lot of guys won't like me saying that, but we took care of it up front. So people didn't have to ask in the office. Because I didn't want to discuss money in the office or when they were coming to the hospital for a procedure. I, just wouldn't, I wasn't into that. It wasn't, I mean, my family, I came from a very poor family. You know, we had four kids. My mom was quite divorced with white beaters. And we weren't into that kind of stuff. Um, you know, some of you might feel the way the hospitals advertise and things. And again, hospitals do great things, but you know, you hear about NB for fertilization, and this and that. And this next phrase is mine. I told a hospital administrator one time, I said, you know, the way you behave sometimes, it makes me think patients are property to you. And you want to own them from concep conception to coffin. If you get that feeling, feel free to use that phrase because that should be a wake-up call to people. And that hospital administrator looked at me and said, think about what I just said to you. We're a service industry. We're not a financial industry looking to rip people off and strip them dry. So I said, there's got to be a way to take care of people. I said, when they come in the door, we don't say how much you got. We say, how much do you need? terms of care. Don't let care be a four-letter word in your institution or your practice. Um, electronic medical records. How many people sit in the office and never see the doctor's face? They just see the side of their head. Okay, we don't like them either. Okay? And the reason we don't like them is because there's a lot of questions that you answer every time somebody comes in the hospital or the office that every doctor doesn't need to ask every time. But the government has put those in place. They insurance companies to put those in place. It occupies a lot of time. Sometimes you can't close those records out unless you answer the questions as much as we don't think we need to. Um, I mean, I've seen patients in the hospital for four or five days that had, had any surgeries, any invasive procedures, and they've got over 500 pages of medical records. And 25 years ago, they might have 50 pages of medical records. So it's a, it's a huge burden on the medical staff to deal with those things. A lot of hospitals don't pay for customization of the medical records. Um, you think about two years ago, there was a doctor in Texas, a patient came in from Africa or someplace, and they died of Ebola. And there was this big hubbub that he didn't have access to part of the chart and didn't know that this person had been in West Africa at the time before they came back to Texas. Well. There's this gigantic company, it's a multi-billion dollar company called Epic, and most of the hospitals use that record, okay? And it's, yeah, I see that, okay? Uh, I have yet to meet somebody who says, I'm absolutely in love with this. I'm going to leave my wife or my husband, and I'm going to go home to Epic, okay? Most of us despise it, all right? We see there's some utility in it, but we want it to work better, and we want it to listen. Well, certain hospitals pay extra money, seven, sometimes eight figure money, to have that customized for their patients so that, that the chart works better. Here's an example. My son was in the hospital three times for congestive heart failure, off and on over about 10 weeks before I took him to the Cleveland Clinic. <clears throat> okay? He broke his ankle. He had a, a urinary tract procedure when he was three years old, a minor urinary tract procedure. Okay, and then he had a broken ankle. <coughs> Okay. They didn't have congestive heart failure in there or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Those weren't the first two diagnoses. The first two diagnoses were 
the, his weenie procedure <laughs> and the broken ankle. And people would walk into the room and say, why are we seeing you because of, of the broken ankle? And I would sit there and my son would look at me and I would introduce myself because some of these people didn't introduce themselves. And I'd stand up and say, hi, I'm Dr. Forte, I'm his father. And uh, you look at his chart, did you? Yeah, I did. Tell me what medicines he's on. Because that took me from being a decent guy much of the time, pardon my French, to just incensing me, in, pardon my French, pissing me off more than I could think about. To where I wanted to reach up like Darth Vader in the middle. Okay? So, don't be fearful of the system. You have to stand up to the system and make it work for you. It should work as well as your trusted mechanic would, but it doesn't all the time. So, make it do that for you. Um, administrators of practices in hospitals have an unhealthy love affair with something called press gainy scores. Do you guys know what this is? What is it? Press gainy scores. You go to the doctor for an appointment for some hospital in practice, or you go to the hospital for treatment, and four, five, six days later you get an electronic survey. Would you come, was this good? Did you come back? Did you recommend this? That's the company called Press Gain. Okay? So hospitals are in love with this. They think this is great because they can put this out there. Here's the problem with it. Okay. You four guys are opioid addicts. All you want are drugs. Okay? All you want are drugs. You stubbed your toe. Nothing happened to you. You really don't care because you just want to get it. You'll say whatever they need to say. And you'll give your buddy's history. And you actually broke your ankle and had a problem. But you all want, all you want is drugs. Okay? And you come into the office, and I see him, and I go, you know, this, I'm not judging you, but on a scale of somebody who's torn their entire rotator cuff out and just had surgery, somebody had an open fracture of their femur, somebody who's had multiple stab wounds, somebody who's had open heart surgery yesterday, um, somebody who had got crushed when a forklift fell on, this isn't hitting my radar the same way. <laughs> and no, 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 and no. You all get surveys. And what happens next week to me? <laughs> Some young person from the administration in their 30s comes around and they want to have a conference with me to talk about some patient complaints because I press gaining scores with one or two or zero instead of ten. I sit in a room and I listen to them. I'm not doing that. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what I'm going to do. And you can look me up. I've got like two reviews on the internet. And I can tell you both people were. And both of them were similar situations to that. Okay? And the hospitals will incentivize doctors based on these press gaining scores. If your press gaining scores are good, you'll get a bonus. If not, you're not get a bonus. Okay? And so I was having a conversation with an administrator one time. He wasn't getting what I was talking about. It was related to my son's care. My son had care that I thought was disjointed insufficient, um, lacking, and I'm familiar, I was chairman of my department in the hospital two different places, and I was head of the intensive care unit two different places, and so for every criticism I had, I had a corrective action list, 11 pages of it, okay, and I said, this is what you do, it's all simple, and the administrator kept giving me pushback and pushback, and the medical director was sitting there, and he was a surgeon, and he was agreeing with me. A month later, that medical director was no longer in that position. He was gone. So I said to the administrator, I said, you know, I said, we're not really having a good conversation here. I said, I gave you this letter a couple weeks ago, and we're having this meeting. You made me wait 20 minutes to start the meeting. And, um, you know, we're not really going to be going on a second date. So I said, I'm going to be real honest with you. I said, what I expected to hear from you is, I appreciate you pointing these things out. You gave me the days that it happened. 
the incident that happened, what you suggested they do, you gave us a corrective action that's easy to do. Thanks, we're going to get back to you in writing when we've taken these corrective actions. But Mr. Administrator, you didn't do that. What you're doing is you're pushing back on me and saying, no, 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 no. So I got up, and I said, you know, I don't have an overinflated view of who I am. But all you people have a sacred trust in us. You expect us to do what's best for you and to communicate that not just to you, but to your family as often as they need it to be communicated. Okay? But Mr. Administrator, you don't get that. So I said, I want to point something out to you. If we don't, does this turn the lights off? Mm -hmm. Probably one. Okay. okay. I'm going to point something out to you. You're not a physician. If we don't show up in the morning, you can't do that. Because you don't have a license to take care of sick and injured people. You can't write prescriptions. You can't order tests. And they came to us. Whether they knew it was going to be us or not doesn't make any difference. They came looking for care. And care is obviously a four-letter word to you. So we ended that discussion. And I said, you know, there's, there's nothing to be done here. I said, I can see that the only thing that's going to happen here is you're either going to communicate with me or you're not. And my son's going to make a decision whether he wants to see a lawyer or not. I'm going to suggest that he does. And after that, they tried to communicate with my son, independent of me, and he wouldn't talk to him. And eventually, my son got sicker and sicker and decided not to do anything about that. What we did was we changed doctors and we moved to the Cleveland Clinic and doctors at Christ Hospital. And so, you know, you hate to see those things happen, but it does happen, and it does happen to people that are medical. So if it happens to us, believe me, it can happen to you. Okay. And I'm not trying. Go ahead. Tell them how Cleveland Clinic treated that, that when you were their office up there. Okay. So my son <coughs> was placed on a medication that was very toxic and all kinds of complications and wasn't given any instructions about this medication. And six months later, my wife and I had gone out of town seen for a couple of weeks before that. <coughs> and I was sick on New Year's Day, which is my wife's birthday, and we get together with a couple of other couples. And one couple, both of them happen to be physicians. And they call me and say, he's sick. I said, well, that's why they come. I don't want to get him cold. What's wrong? They said, he looks bad. The next day, they saw him in the office, and his hemoglobin was 7.5. Normal's about 13 and a half to 16 and a half. His liver enzymes were way elevated. Um, we walked into the cardiologist's office the next day. The same cardiologist I'm going to, who I think is a very bright person, who's a good person. I went to the meeting, the office call with my son and his wife. He came in, we were the last patients of the day. And what I didn't hear was, this is problematic, we think it's this medicine you're on. We're going to have to do an echocardiogram and see what your rejection fraction is, see what's going on. We're going to have to find out where this blood went that you lost. You're going to have to have endoscopy. And um, we're going to have to make some decisions when we get your hemoglobin hematocrit back up um, and figure out what we're going to do because you're not going to be able to continue to take this medication. Instead of hearing that, he walked in before he sat down, before he examined my son, and I listened to him through his flannel shirt, was, um, <coughs> wow, you're going to need a heart transplant. That horse was out of the gate already. It was going for the triple crown. And I had to explain for an hour after that, outside the cold to my son and my daughter-in-law, why that was inappropriate. That was the opening remark. You're going to need a heart transplant. Now, he eventually did, but he didn't need it for four more years. Okay. So we switched doctors after they had put him in the hospital, because he went to the hospital a couple days later for endoscopy. And instead of having his endoscopy first up in the morning, they did him last of the day. And he was delayed and delayed. And when he was waking up, he was complaining of some pain in his flank over here. And they said, well, it's gas, it's gas. I said, you know, he doesn't have pain like this. I said, I'm not sure that's gas. And they said, well, he's, he's doing okay. Everything's stable. He should be ready to go. I took him home because his kids were real little and um, his wife, 
his children. I took them home and stayed here for a couple of hours. And I said, you know, this, I don't like this. If this keeps up, you call me. We're going back to the merchant. Well, he didn't really want to call me. And the next day, I'm starting in the office. And I get a call from his wife that says, we're in the emergency room. He's no problem. Okay. I get my associates to cover right now in the emergency room. By the time I get there, they've got a cat skin on him. And he's got a clot in one of the segmental arteries in the kidney. Okay, so part of the kidney is going to die with that. And um, he's put in the hospital, and they take him off some of his medicines. One of them was a $5 medicine called lisinopril. Anybody on that for blood pressure? Okay. Well, what this medicine does is it relaxes the aorta, and it reduces the pressure against which the aorta has to push. So it's called an afterload reducer. It makes it easier for the heart to work. Okay. So they took him off that $5 a month medicine. Um, they put him on an IV that was running at about an ounce and a half an hour, but nothing to eat or drink. And he hadn't had anything to eat or drink at this point for over 36 hours oh, and was not making urine. And I called the hospitalist who doesn't know him. It's just somebody at the hospital hires because they don't want your family doctor coming in here and take care of you. And, um, the hospitalist says, well, blah, 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 blah. And I says, he's not making any urine. <clears throat> you either need to give him fluids or you need to give him something to make him pee so he doesn't clot in his ureter and have to go to surgery. And I'm like, okay, I'm the old guy. I'm explaining this to this guy. He ought to know this. This is basic stuff. So um, finally, they weren't doing anything. And I called the cardiologist and I said, you know, what? we got to do something here about this. I mean, I'm pushing this button, and I don't really want to be pushing this button, and I don't want to be driving this. You guys should be doing this spontaneously. And so they, the cardiologist came over and ordered increased fluids, and then he started passing urine. So my son improved somewhat pain-wise, but then he went home, got worse, developed massive swelling of his legs, couldn't work, <coughs> couldn't do a shower without stopping. Uh, went back in the hospital about 10 days later, and I stopped working. I was going over there every day and staying with him and watching what was going on and trying to keep track of everything, measuring his ankles and his calves. And, um, so he goes back in the hospital, and um, when he shows up, his pro time, do people know what that is? If you're on Coumadin, they measure your pro time and INR to see what the... Um, how thin your blood is. Well, his blood was very thin. But one leg was inches larger than the other one, not just a little bit, it was big. And we go in the hospital and they're going to treat him for more than just a heart failure. And I said, you know, there's only two things that cause that. One's lymphedema, the other's a blood clot in the leg. Unless you've got a surgical clamp on the vein. You know, so I said, are you going to ultrasound his legs? So we don't need to do that. His blood is way too thin to make him clot. I said, I didn't ask you that. I said, tell me why it's not one of those two things that I said. And I don't usually talk to another physician like that. Okay? And this happened to be the son of one of my coaches. And I really didn't want to talk to that guy like that because I really, really think a lot of his dad. Okay? And finally, he goes, well, if it's going to make you happy, we'll do it. Yeah, that's going to make me happy. So about 45 minutes later, the nurse comes in and says, uh, Dr. So-and-so wants to talk to you. So I got him, he says, hey, uh, you know, that was a good call. They just called me from the ultrasound suite, and he's got two clots in his left calf. Great. Thanks. Okay, so shortly thereafter, a resident comes in and he wants to give him vitamin K to keep his blood from being so thin. I said, wait a minute. I said, you know he's got two clots in his leg. If you just wait this out by tomorrow morning, he hasn't had a stroke. He isn't bleeding externally. He hasn't passed his blood in his urine or stool. If you wait this out for 12 hours, that medicine's going to be metabolized. You check his level tomorrow. He is going to need vitamin K. He probably isn't going to have another clot. Well, but he needs vitamin K. I said, no, no, that's what the book tells you he needs to keep his blood from being so thin. What you need to do is think this through 
And I said, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm trying to tell you how to think and what to think and go look it up. So he went and called the staff guy and he very begrudgingly agreed to do that. Well, the next day his blood was where it needed to be. No more clots. He was improving because they were giving him uh, Lasix, so something to make him urinate through the IV. So he gets dismissed from the hospital after 10 days, and now he's coughing up blood when he's at home. And um, we take him back to the hospital, and they put him in the hospital, and uh, he's swollen again within days of getting out of the hospital. They put him back in the hospital and um, start doing the same thing, and he's got a different cardiologist coming in to see him because the different cardiologist is on service, they call it. He's on call for the hospital patient. Well, this is the same cardiologist that saw him two weeks earlier and did an echocardiogram on him and told me he had a clot in his left ventricle. And I said, are you sure that's what that is? He said, because he's been on Coumadin and his blood's been thinner than it should be. No, it's a clot. Okay. I said, does he need any other testing? No. Okay. I said, well, that doesn't sound right to me, but um, the other guy, he didn't, I had to push my son in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk in the hospital. And they said, uh, so should we go to the office? He says, no, they'll, they'll call you. Okay. And I'm looking at my son and saying, it sure looks like a hospital case to me. So we go in the hospital a third time, and he's worse off. And uh, he's in the hospital, and they're giving him Lasix, and he's not in the ICU. And this younger cardiologist says, uh, He's not even see, he's got to come in and see the blood in the trash can. He's spitting it in the trash can. And I said, that, finally, for three days, I said, you know, what are we going to do about this? And the guy turns around and says to me, well, you have to understand something. I'm just covering. I'm not his regular cardiologist. <laughs> and I gripped onto the chair, and I sat there because I knew if I stood up, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be good. But the thought did pass through my head. This guy was worth going to jail for because the average sentence for murder in the state of Ohio was seven years. And that's not a long time to take somebody like that out of circulation to keep him from killing people. Okay? Which and, and I'm kidding about that. I'm, I'm kidding. But uh, this guy really, really upset me. Um, and I said, wow. I said, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say there, but I said, I guess the question would be, if you had an associate that was in Europe for two weeks or in Canada or Alaska on a fishing trip for 10 days, and he had a patient come in that was having crushing chest pain, and his troponin level was elevated, his EKG was abnormal, and everything indicated that he was having a heart attack, you would say, I'm not your regular cardiologist, I'm not taking you to the cath suite, put a catheter up there, she'd die in there, try and lice that clot with blood thinner and put a stent in, or see if you need emergency open heart surgery, you're just going to give him morphine and nitroglycerin and wait for your buddy to come back off his vacation. And he looks at me and I said, you know, I got nothing for that. I said, I, that's not something I ever expected to hear from a staff guy's mouth. So I said, yeah, I said, well, we're finished here. You can go ahead. So the next day I got a call from the pulmonary doctor that they called to see him. And the pulmonary doctor says, uh, well, we think he needs to go to a tertiary care center like the Cleveland Clinic. Okay, that's fine. So uh, I'm in the next day. Actually, I came in that day. Later, my wife had gone in in the morning, and I saw the guy sitting there. He was on the phone. He was looking at a computer in the room right next to my son, and I waved to him. This was a guy that was a fellow in lung specialty diseases when I was in my first residency, so I would see him in the ICU all the time. So he knew who I was. And I said, you know, like, I'm going to be in there. And he goes, two hours later, he's not there. And I came in at 5 o'clock. I go outside. I said, where is so-and-so? He said, he left. Well, my son's father-in-law is a vascular surgeon that I work with. He had, he had open heart surgery. And the same guy saw him leave the hospital. Vascular surgeon's son, my son's brother-in-law, is a hand upper extremity surgical specialist. And his wife is a cardiologist 
and her dad is a cardiologist at Harvard. And her uncle is a surgeon that I trained with. So the dad, the vascular surgeon, has open heart surgery and has a complication. And they call the lung guy. And they want to talk to him at the end of the day. Just stop by so we can talk to him. So we got three doctors sitting in the room waiting. Where'd he go? I just saw him down the hall. Well, that. It's Monday night. What's he going to theater or something? You know? So I left it to the son the next day to have his wife for with that particular fellow. So a couple days go by with my son, and there's no arrangements being made to send him to Cleveland Clinic. Well, they want to send him home on a $700 a month medication and have him go to the Cleveland Clinic a couple of days later. I said, okay, that's fine. I said, well, it's Saturday. I said, everybody's not going to have this medication. Why don't you give him three days of the medication and give him the prescription? And I said, uh, you know, we got to find a pharmacy that's got it. So a Carter's on Hyde Park has it. I said, well, that's great. I said, but he needs some so that we can bridge him until we can get the full prescription. But we can't give it to you. You're not on Medicaid, so we can't give it to you. If you're on Medicaid, we'd give you the whole prescription for free. Okay. All right. I got that. And I understand that. So I said, did you call the pharmacy? Yeah, they have it. Okay. Are they going to fill it? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So we go to the pharmacy, and he's in the car, and it's 10 degrees out. So let me run in and get it, and I'll bring it out. I said, well, we can't give it to you. I mean, you can't give it to me. We can't give it to you because the insurance company hasn't approved it. I so said, he got put in the hospital, and they knew they were going to put him on it. They did a three-day trial. Supposed to be a three-day trial, but they did a 24-hour trial. and said, he's doing okay with this. We're going to go ahead and dismiss him. I said, so what are we supposed to do? And your only option is for you to have the prescription filled off the insurance. Okay, I'll pay for it. What's it going to cost? $740. What did you say? $740 for 30 pills. Philip. I said, I'll deal with that later on. Which, that was never reimbursed to my son. I paid. And I'm not complaining. That's what you have to do. You've got to make decisions about things like that when you're going through these processes. So, think about what's happening, what needs pre-approval. That's why you read about your plans and things like that. So, my son's doing no better. And I said, okay, it's Saturday evening. I'm taking you tomorrow to the Cleveland Clinic. You're going home. Yep, one o'clock in the afternoon. You spend 18 hours at home, I'll take it there. So we're driving up to Cleveland Clinic. You can see downtown Cleveland and we're on 71. There's another road that comes in and they kind of merge. And there's something in the middle of the road. I can't get over because there's a bridge thing. We're on an overpass and there's a truck next to me, so I have to straddle whatever's in the road. My car stops. We hit something that I was hoping was a piece of tire. And ends up being a piece of metal and tearing out the exhaust system. Yeah. <laughs> so the police have to come, and luckily they had a small police, but he got underneath and pulled this thing out that we could drive. It's not like we had a NASCAR, though. And so we get to the hospital hotel, and um, we get him in the hospital, and they start him on his lysinopril the next day, and they ask me, How come he didn't get put back on his lysinopril? I said, I didn't know he wasn't on it, and he had access to his chart. And they said, Well, we're going to start him back on that. And see what's happening tomorrow. Well, 18 hours later, he was doing better. He was up walking around the ward. By well, the time he left the cleaning clinic nine days later, he'd lost 40 pounds of fluid. And it had a catheterization on the right side of his heart that gave us objective information on which to teach him. Which, when we came back, was when we switched to the cardiologist. We had a Christ hospital. Um, so that $5 a month medicine was very important. And it missed, was missed by nine cardiologists, I think it was, and 15 interns. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that because I had access to his chart. When he got his chart to take the Cleveland Clinic, it was thousands of pages. And I'm going through the chart, because you give it to them, and they put it through a machine and images it. They give it back to me, so I get this big stack of paper. And I'm going through it in the hotel at night. So wait a minute. They didn't put him back on that. Well, 
the other thing that happened was he was at the children's hospital and he was getting echocardiograms every year. And with his condition, it was caused, he had a virus when he was young, when I was in medical school, and about nine months later, his echocardiogram started to change. So we knew we had to keep him under monitoring. The Children's Hospital did an absolutely outstanding job of monitoring him and doing testing and things like that. And um, he uh, had his echo every year. And <coughs> we took him at one point to Texas Heart Institute for a consultation and then took him to the Minneapolis Heart Institute because they each had probably the number one and number two people, experts in the world in his disease. And the number one guy was at Minneapolis at the time. He's now in Boston with his son. And um, he said, have an echo every year, and if it changes, make sure you send it to me. And he gave us a written letter, which I physically gave to the cardiologist and explained to him. It. it was a guy I knew. This is what needs to be done. After my son went to the Cleveland Clinic and I got his records, I found out that he had to transition out of Children's Hospital when he was 23 or 25. They didn't have adult cardiologists there. Now they do because they realize a lot of these people that had pediatric cardiology problems were not having good results when they transitioned to adult cardiology care. So they brought in people that are trained in adult and pediatric cardiology to make sure these people could continue lifelong. Great idea. Okay. Well, um, when I got his records, I found out that over the course of 12 years, remember this kid's supposed to be having an echocardiogram every year, we have a total of, not 11, two echocardiograms. Two. Wow. Two. Needless to say, my month was not made with that information either, but there's nothing you can do in the retrospective scope. But I don't want that with somebody else. Okay, so I tell people because it should have never happened. And um, so uh, he got his heart transplanted in April of 2016. I just came back this afternoon from the Cleveland Clinic with him. He had his two-year checkup. And he's had good biopsy results and good cardiac cath results. And uh, hopefully that will continue. But um, his current providers are at Christ Hospital. He won't be changed locally. Because luckily, his cardiologist is his age and married to the daughter of some friends of ours. So, one of us goes up there for a second opinion about prostate cancer. And we're wondering what's going on. Tell us how that omnibus office works. What do they do? How, I mean, well, they don't they arrange your appointments. The but they really pay attention if you have anything at all, right? Yeah, you call these people, the patient care representative, and you explain what your concerns are. If you want to write them a letter, you can write them a letter, but you call them and explain it. And then their job is to go and try to investigate it and try to help you work through if you don't understand something, if you need more resources, if you're dissatisfied and you want to change doctors, they should not necessarily direct you to a doctor, but help you go through that process, whether they will or not, I don't know. Um, ideally, if, if you've got a serious issue and you want a second opinion, your own physician should be suggesting to people outside of their practice that can offer that second opinion. Which, by the way, after I met the administrator with the light deal and gave him my 11-page letter, they did have my son's chart reviewed by an associate of the guys that gave him inadequate care. And I pointed out that that was totally inappropriate and, you know, was not going to fly in any place. You know, you always get somebody that's external to the practice and maybe even out of state. But um, the, the ombudsman slash patient care representative, that's for people that have questions, problems, complaints about their care that they don't think are being addressed. But in the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm not here pushing the Cleveland Clinic, I just have to say this because this is where we went. I walked into the place, and the interior of the cardiology section of the hospital is painted all white. And then they have artwork on the walls. They actually have art tours. And I'm going through various places of the hospital where my son's having procedures done. Um, and I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm walking to the light. 
And then I realized after a few days that it actually was very common. And I never saw a place that could bring people in in the morning. It's like a, pardon my description, it's like a toilet flushing of people into the Cleveland Clinic. And they got valet parkers, they got this, they got that. And it's not two or three valet parkers. It's 20 or 30 with four lanes of traffic coming into that building. And they were putting them in the garage and they're coming back and all this and that. And at 5 o'clock, people are leaving. And I'm going, I never left on time in 42 years. <laughs> never. Never. If I did get out early, I'd barely get home and I'd get called to go back for another six or eight hours. And I'm not complaining, but I don't know how they do that. I have no idea how they do that. But it happens. My son, when he got put on the transplant list, we went up there one time, he had 14 different appointments in one day. Oh my God. And I didn't say anything to him, but I'm saying to myself, yeah, right. And I got a hotel room and didn't tell him about it because the Cleveland Clinic owns three hotels. One's between two of their clinical buildings and one's across the street from their, one of their cancer centers. I got the hotel room and at four o'clock, he was finished. He didn't start till 7.30. I said, how did he see eight different specialists go to the lab, get an echocardiogram, get an EKG, get an x-ray, get all this stuff done? And it happened in, in eight and a half hours, and he got time to go to lunch? I would have never thought it was possible, but it did happen. So anybody who wants to go up there, let me know. I'll be glad to give you some resources. And I'm not pushing you to go there. I'm just, you know, people go different places for those kind of things. So let me, um, what you say is not a general question. Okay. If there's a complication, you want to ask a question. Are you going to do a safety tree analysis of this? A what? A safety tree analysis. It's like diagramming sentences when you were in grade school and high school. You know, what's the object, what's the verb, and all that kind of stuff. That kind of thing. Did this happen? Yes, no. Okay, would this have caused this? Yes, no. Are they going to do that so that the complication doesn't happen again? And are they going to give you that report or involve you in that process? You know how many hospital administrators were willing to do that over my career? Zero. Zero. That many. Um, Jehovah Witnesses. I dealt with tons of them. Once you deal with a couple of them and you honor their wishes, get down what they want. Um, in terms of what they'll accept, whether it's blood, IVs, whatever. The only time I wouldn't take care of them is somebody who was a convert that didn't really understand their religion and refused an IV. I said, I can't take care of that. If you'll take an IV, we will work with you. You'll sign a document that says what we can and can't do. But you know, once you once you do that with a Jehovah Witness, and everybody here, Jehovah Witness, don't tell me. Once you do that, the whole temple's coming to you <laughs> because you're not giving them a hard time. Um, I had a friend who was at a hospital here. He had an aortic arch aneurysm where the aorta comes out of the heart. And he'd been on multiple medications for sedation. So he would be compliant with the ventilator for over a month. And to this day, and up to that point, I'd never seen anybody on so many intravenous bags in my entire career. I told his wife that. And his internist is a good buddy of mine and my internist, and we're talking. And he calls me and he says, the hospitalist wants to pull the plug on him because he's not responsive. I said, he can't be responsive. He weighs 385 pounds and he's getting all these medications. They're stored in his fat system. You're going to have to wait seven days to see if he even wakes up. Well, they were telling the wife they need to pull the plug on a guy. Well, they said, no, we're not doing that. They didn't even talk to the surgeons. Well, the surgeons found out they went ballistic. And so they didn't pull the plug on a guy. The guy's now um, driving. Oh. Doesn't work anymore. Um, the same guy, and he lives. I mean, I can have a conversation that is worthwhile, more than worthwhile. He's just not processing exactly like he used to. Same guy was on the ventilator at uh, the hospital where my son was in the rehab unit, and he had some bleeding, and they found that he had cancer in the esophagus. And the wife said, we don't want to tell him this because he's awake and alert, and he's on the ventilator, and we have to get through this to then tell him that. And some nursing manager said, no, we have to tell him. And the nursing manager told him against the family's wishes. And she asked me what to do, and I said, you know, 
I want my lawyer's number because that's what I do. So they never do it again because that's a family decision. That's not a medical decision about that. Um, there's a term for guys like me, probably. I haven't had it assigned to me that I know of. It's called disruptive physician. If you don't agree with what the hospital or the insurance company's plan and program is, you know, you're disruptive. It's kind of like the movie 1984, Soy and Green, those kind of things. Huh. Okay. So have an advocate in the room. Have an advocate. Because you've got to have somebody that's keeping an eye on you and keeping an eye on the people that are supposed to keep an eye on your family. Put a bowl in the room with cheap candy in it. Who is that for us, though, as lay people? Who is our, who, where do we find that? Well, you find a friend that you can talk to. You use a younger person, a daughter, a son, a wife, a husband. If you need help, you talk to your primary care and see if they'll get involved. If they won't get involved, then maybe you need a different primary care. Um, and frankly, that's earlier in this conversation. I said I get calls all the time. I mean, I don't want to be everybody's advocate at the hospital, but I answer those questions a lot. I mean, people call and say, well, this is going on, I don't like this, what do you think? And sometimes if you just explain what the potential options are as to why that's occurring, they get it and they can work with that to get to the next stage and they may or may not call you back. I mean, a lot of times they don't call you back and then you run into somebody in the street and they go, oh, you, uh, yeah, hey, thanks, that happened. So um, check out your physicians, State of Ohio, State of Kentucky, Kentucky Medical Board. Look them up, okay? Um, I'm gonna pass out some articles here if you wanna look at them, fine. If you wanna give copies, but uh, you know, First up, we got a, a case of a guy who did surgery on himself. He wasn't a doctor. <laughs> okay. Next uh, is a letter that I sent. It was a quality improvement plan I wrote un, unrequested for the VA in 2004 and then sent it to Mr. McDonald when he became the VA secretary. Oh, Still waiting on a response. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's him. That's probably the system. Next is a little Christmas newsletter I wrote after I did an article years ago, and I kind of condensed it. And I send this out, and the question is, do you get something like this? Not that I'm great, but it gets to a lot of people. It's been around the world a couple of times. Here's a recommended immunization schedule that goes with that. Here's some information on the Dr. Durrani thing and the suit and the oh. Channel 5 link. Uh, here's an article on Sexual misconduct in Rhode Island doesn't stop Doc from practicing next door in Connecticut. Here's one, the uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel wrote a big series of articles about this. So well, some of these articles are from there. Uh, Medicare slow to boot docs with state sanctions. Federal programs keep paying physicians found incompetent or unethical. Okay, uh, no one, multiple lawsuits, multiple deaths, nine hundred thousand dollars for Medicare. And, there's that one. Rehab slavery, keeping bad docs in business. University of Southern California's gynecological report of gynecologist working with student health. Uh, the rehab slavery, people are supposed to be in drug rehab. And the rehab company was um, using them to perform work and not really rehab. Um, here's another one about a doctor. Um, Profile in the Washington Post is an openly gay doctor. I don't know what that's got to do with anything, but you know I don't care. I care what job they do. Known for aggressive treatment style, treating HIV patients. In Virginia, he's an addict. In New York, he's treating them. Making what? Making what? <laughs> okay. So you can find this stuff all over the internet. So there is a small group of people that cause a big group of problems. And you want to make sure you're not going to one of them. Um, you know, one of the questions, you have a total hip or a total knee. How many of these have you done, doctor? When I went, How do you prove that? Well, you can look them up on the internet sometimes and find out. I think there's a, a Medicare thing that will let you find that out. Um, the way I found out was my orthopedic surgeon, my problem was if I went to you, he'd get mad because I work with both of you guys in the operating room. If you're a better buddy of mine, okay, I think he might be more objective to what I totally need. But if I have an infection or a major problem, 
you got to live with it and i got to live with it and I don't want to do that to you because you're my friend. Plus, if we're in the operating room, all of a sudden there's a doctor in here, it's Dr. So-and-so. Things are going to be a little different. I don't want that. I want the people that I'm going to be just like you, you, and you. That's who I want doing mine. So my orthopedic guy said, why don't you go to Columbus where I train? Great. I went up there and saw somebody up there. I sat in the office. The door was cracked. The next day they were doing the two docs that were in the practice were doing 18 total, hip or total knee replacements. I was the local patient. They had patients from Saudi Arabia and Hawaii. I said, I'm in the right place. After surgery, I got my report. It took them 42 minutes to do my total pain. I said, I went to the right place. Not that there's not a lot of right places. There are. But I don't want somebody doing it that's doing two a month. I don't want them. I don't want them trusting my wheels. I mean, I'm known for speed. <laughs> speed moves, right? So, um, let's see. I mean, I could give you a bunch of examples of things that occurred, um, but we're running out of time here. Um, I mean, I'll stay as long as people want to stay. Any general questions? You guys got any general questions for Tom? Great experience with you. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just thinking that I didn't hear you name hospitals until you. I'm not going to name hospitals except where my son received good care. Christ, yeah. I, I thought maybe if somebody asked you, you could name the hospitals. I'm so good. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I don't want to be known at the end of my life as the guy who said something bad. And there's a lot of good things. Even the hospital where my son had trouble, a lot of good things happened at that hospital. A lot. And i got to get over that. And I, I've gone back there for other things. Um, uh, my son will never walk back in the door because of what happened to him, and I understand that. But I work with too many physicians at that hospital that are good people and do a good job, do a great job, and the nurses that do a great job, but I can't do that to them because that's not fair and it's not right. But if somebody were to ask me my preferred cardiologist, I would give them the name. Now, in years past, before the internet, my wife used to tell people I marked their insurance book. And I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And what I would do was I kept a list for my wife in case I got injured or I was out of town or I got killed. And I had a list of a lot of people in different specialties that I was good with. And then I had a red list. And the red list were people I wouldn't go to. And it was various reasons. One, I knew that they, their skills were not what they should be. Uh, they had complications they shouldn't be having or more than other people in the same and in surgery, one of the biggest things I did, I wouldn't use a surgeon, no matter how good they were, except in emergency circumstances. I wouldn't use them if they were married and tacked around. And people would say, what's that got to do with anything? I said, it's a lot to do with everything, because they're not worried about what they're supposed to be worried about. They're worried about where they're going to meet for their next trip. And maybe that's just me. But I, had that, I saw that affect the timeliness of some people get the medical care they needed over my earlier career. And I said, no, they're not getting anything. In fact, I was out of town and my long lost father who deserted us when I was about four had moved back to Cincinnati. And I was out of town on vacation with my family and I came back and I'm on call the next day. And lo and behold, I look at the schedule and there he's on the schedule to have a vascular surgery. Oh, jeez. So here we go. So he has his vascular surgery and after a surgery, he has a lot of swelling in a very tender place. And I go up the scene just to try to be decent. And he says, well, that doctor barely stuck his head in there. Well, well what he didn't know was that before that case started that day, the surgeon's older partner, who was a really good friend of mine, a fabulous surgeon also, and a decent human being came to me and said, why'd you send your dad to him? Why didn't you send him to me? And I didn't know anything about it. What I found out was the family doctor, who I had written letters for to get into medical school, without calling me to say, where shall I send your dad? Sent him to the other guy. Okay, so there's all this baloney going on. And in the end, I said, you know, the guy did a good job for you. 
You don't like his personality. I wouldn't have sent you to him because I don't like his personality and I don't like this other business that he does. But you did that too to my mom. So what the hell does that make a difference to you for? You know, that's what I wanted to say to him. I didn't. But that's what I wanted to say. But, you know, I mean, I had an associate that would be on his boat up to look above Coney Island. And you're supposed to be able to get to the hospital in 20 minutes. Well, I was the head of the department. This guy was older than me. And there was no way he could get to the hospital. So who'd they call? And who got there in 20 minutes? And that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, when you're on call, my thing was, and I'm not, I don't play tennis, but I'm not going to go play tennis. I'm not going to go drinking. I don't drink anyway. But you don't do that stuff. You people expect us to answer that call. And you expect us to answer that call in timely fashion, in tip-top mental condition, to be able to do the technical things we need to do and to think, to be able to take care of you and then respond to your family when you're stabilized. And if I'm screwing around, if I'm drinking, if I'm in a movie and turn my pager off, Whatever scenario you can think of, there's a good chance that ain't happening. And so, is the department chairman to get those calls? And I got a lot. Of them. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Um, you mentioned the Ohio Medical Board as a good online resource. What kind of information? Well, if you go to the Ohio State Medical Board, you can put anybody's name in. Like you could put my name, in, and you could look me up. And what it'll say is. Um, Specialties are self-declared. So if I told them I was a neurosurgeon, it would list neurosurgery, but it would have this disclaimer that said that's what it's a self-reported specialty. They don't verify that. Okay, the hospitals and insurance companies verify their credentials. Alright? So like if you look at this Dr. Durrano that fled to Pakistan and all these lawsuits are going on, you can read documents from the proceedings related to those cases at the state medical board level. Those are not private documents. You could read that stuff. Um, you know, if you hear about some guy on the news and you think, whoa, what's that all about? And you just start nosing. You could look them up. You can look your family doctor up. You can look all these other people up, see if they have a valid current license. Now, some people will have action on their license um, because they didn't do their continuing education right on time, okay? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure they report that anymore, but I've always done that on time, but I never thought that was the biggest deal because we used to have, have 50 hours a year, and um, that's a lot, okay? Um, but you'll see if somebody has had uh, numerous lawsuits or you could read the newsletter, that's a good place to start. Go there and read their monthly newsletter because you'll see names, towns, what action was taken on the license of that person, whether it was drugs, alcohol, something with a patient, uh, some other criminal activity or something like that. You can see if the license was surrendered. You can see if the license was revoked permanently, whether they were put on suspension. You can see all that stuff. And um, I suggest you do it. This is the Ohio State Medical Board? Any medical board, you should be able to look that up. I, don't, I haven't checked all 50 of them, but you should be able to look that up. I know Ohio you can, and Kentucky. At one time, I had about six state licenses, because I would keep a license any place we went on vacation, so that if one of my kids got a cold or something like that, I could write a prescription for the antibiotics and the decongestants. Um, and then as they got older, I stopped doing that. I just have a higher license. But you'll see that. If you look at my profile, you'll see license inactive for these other states. So look me up. I don't know how many years. You're not going to see anything. You're going to be disappointed. Okay. But. Why don't we break it up now? If we want to talk to Tom privately for a second, like that. We've got a random. Who wants them? I can get them to the gym. And, you know, they can put them wherever they want to put them. All right. And 